the <coughs> first part of the 60 Minutes piece is going to be showable, although I'm not sure. Because uh, Leslie Stahl introduces me really well. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to her play for a moment, and then we'll tell you what it is she has overcome that makes her story so remarkable. <laughs> just six years ago on videotape. She's having an epileptic seizure. How did this Martha Curtis become this Martha Curtis, a solo violinist? That's our story. Okay. All right, so she, she grabs a, the important information right away. Uh, those seizures started when I was three. And I started in status epilepticus, you know, one grab mal seizure after another, which is how people die, because you don't get enough air in between, you don't get enough oxygen. And so, but fortunately we see that we got, I, my mother got me to the hospital fast enough, and where they were able to pump me full of, uh, it was fetal bar then. And that, at that point then they got these with meds, they got down to temporal lobe seizures so that they were starting, you know, on one side and uh, in the limbic system, which is why things start with an overwhelming emotion. I know some of you are familiar with this kind of seizure, but um, not everybody has to do this. Um, so for, and for some people, this, this huge overwhelming emotion is ecstasy, and which was Dostoevsky, right? Um, in one of his novels, how could anyone want to take this from me? Mine was terror. And it was, they, they started from out, well, they started by hitting right here, you know, where, where everyone feels fear. It was just this extreme feeling right here, and something was coming from the horizon. At, at this point, however, it's, it's eeriness that I'm about to be done in, that I'm about to be killed. Um, but it's, it's still pretty far away, and as the storm spread, however, um, things just got less and less safe, and I could feel it, you know, spread here. And then, if it jumped to the other side, something came over my left shoulder to kill me, just incredible force to kill me. So, my life was these gradations of fear from weariness to terror for over 30 years. But, well, Fortunately, it was only part of my life. My mother, of course, was scared like everybody's mother. Um, everybody's parents, you know, with a three-year-old, all of a sudden, you know, with a perfectly fine three-and-a-half-year-old, um, all of a sudden in this state. And she went to my doctor, after I'd been released on the feet bar, um, she went to my doctor just, you know, rattled, um, really rattled, she said, and. She said, she just wouldn't stop. So finally, she said, he just put my, his hand over my mouth and said, listen to me. What your daughter has is a medical problem. You could create a really serious problem here. <laughs> and then said, you know, she has a lot. This one can do anything. You've got to get out of her way. I am grateful to that doctor forever. Um, and, and then she did. Within a year and a half, I was playing the piano and dancing, and she entered me this way into a world of beauty and order, which goes a long way for somebody who's in that sort of chaos in their own brain. So I wanted to play you an example of this kind of beauty and order. This is a piece that we wrote.
Think about it. She was training cognitive skill, physical skill, and access to my expressive self. And there really isn't a whole lot else. Um, so my, my mother got a lot of questions. You know, the press came at her pretty hard, and especially once 60 Minutes had happened. And one of the people from the press asked her this question. Why, if you knew your daughter had this problem, would you put her down the path of music? And of course, that question is, why? If you knew your daughter could seize, did you put her in front of people? And my mother was very politic. She, she thought about that for a second and said, look, at three and a half, I just saw a door slam in her face. You know, I just saw potential um, be taken away. And I did anything I could to just open doors. That was a really good answer. She took me aside later and said, what I wanted to say was what? She would have been better off convulsing as a waitress? Um, <laughs> because I was, you know, I was seizing from time. You know, I, I had, you know, seizures. Even people did SAR didn't see partial complex or um, simple or complex partial seizures, you know, at least five times a month, and, you know, breaking through that, those drugs. That it was one drug at that time. So, I switched to the violin at age nine. She couldn't play the violin, she was a pianist. And this put me in an orchestra, which is where I fell in love. You know, there's all that sound, all those instruments, it just makes your whole body vibrate. And this gave me a place to develop my passionate love for life. It also put me on stage where people express pride instead of fear. And I think most people here know that it is no fun. Um, to come to from a seizure, because people's faces don't look good. The world doesn't generally look so great. You know, people are standing going, are you okay? I didn't know what to do. Um, but when a 12 year old bounces off stage, uh, you know, people look real good. The, the face just looks a lot better because they think you're amazing. Um, and it became very clear that my violin would focus the world, and then I'm probably more importantly, myself, on music and set it up, well, see, you know, my strengths. Now, I wanted to go, after going to the, the Interlochen camp in the summertime, um, that was pretty fun because, you know, from time to time I was having these complex parts with seizures and I'd sort of end up outside of my practice room and, you know, perhaps a supervisor would make sure I got back in there and I thought, okay, I'm not even gonna tell her what happened. Um, and I'd go back in and I'd practice. And everyone just thought, you know, I was a little odd. But, um, but I could play, and I could, I could go to challenges, and I could meet people. So people don't question it as hard if you can just kind of do something like that. Well, I wanted to go to the Arts Academy, and that's year round. You know, that's, that's a high school, it's a boarding school. And I was accepted with a large scholarship. I played the audition, got accepted with this big scholarship, but then they want the paperwork. And in the paperwork, of course, are the medical records. And so we sent the medical records, and I got a letter back saying, among other things, saying, we are not equipped to handle you here. And I was 13, and I really wanted to be there. And my mother called the doctor, who said, get out of her way, and said, somebody else is in her way. And that doctor called whoever they called. I mean, he did whatever magic those people do. And I got back into the school. And what he said, I found out later, is she's only having auras. I thought, you know, um, <laughs> no. And then he turned to me and said, you can take anywhere from 180 to 300 milligrams of phenobarb a day. I don't know how many people in this room take a phenobarb, but 300 milligrams of phenobarb is a lot of downer. Um, so that's what I did. And every time I was having a lot of trouble, I just slammed in 300 milligrams, trying to stay more at 180. But then I'd slam it back out, so there are things I really don't remember. But, but apparently, I played every rehearsal, I played every concert, and, and I graduated salutatorian. Because I had gone off there, gone, to um, concentrate all efforts to function at a very high level. Because you know, we're very dependent, like everybody else in the world, on other people's perception of us. And so I thought I'd just kind of carve out a place where I could do what I, you know, where I was a little unarguable that way. If you get A's on tests, you know, what are they going to say? Sorry, we can't have you here. Um, 
So, and that's actually a lot of work because I couldn't, you know, I went on to the Eastman School of Music and, um, but a new drug was added and so now I was on Dina Barber and another one. And reading comprehension is just really hard. So, you know, getting A's in classes where you have to read books is not a simple thing. Um, I would wake up, I just kind of wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning um, after a seizure. And reading was really hard. I always had, you know, I ended up in seizure if I tried to read anything too dry. And music history, it's a little dry. So I come to and think, I gotta find another way. Um, I had to come up with stra other strategies, and the beauty was that I could sit in front of and take like stream of consciousness notes, just write down as much as I could, and then make my own outline. And then I just put it in a different part of my body by learning it by rhythm. You know, I want this to be very rhythmic. You know, and I could sort of dance my way through this outline and memorize it that way. I got A's on their test without reading my books. Um, <laughs> so somebody found out my senior year. I said it in the library right behind one of my teachers who thought I did a great job. And I said, yeah, I never read that book. I was talking to someone else and she just wheeled around. <laughs> I said, the grades are in. So, you know, I just, the, the problem, the problem, of course, is that you're in and out, right? You're just kind of, you come and go a little too often sometimes. Um, but human beings have what I think of as flexible intelligence. You've got to come up with your own, your own answers here. And nobody's out coaching people with epilepsy in college about how to pull through that test. So what, what I did was I always went to a mirror to figure out what I was thinking. Because that's really what matters. What you're thinking, what you're feeling. The world's going to tell you how to feel. Oh, don't feel so bad. Oh, blah, blah. You know, or you shouldn't think like that. You should think like this. And meanwhile, the only thing that's really important is what you're thinking and what you're feeling. Because that's the only way you can make an informed decision about what you want. Right? It's the only way you can make a smart decision about what you want is to go find out what it is. And so I did it with there. And because there, there I had the only eyes that understood. I didn't have to fill in the story. There was no backstory I had to tell the person about. I didn't have to, you know, keep them comfortable with how I said it. I could just speak straight to the only eyes that knew what I was talking about and, and not get all the judgment. So I would talk, I'd cry my head off and coach myself forward. You can do it, Martha. I know you can do this. And I... And I did, but by graduation I was seasoned visibly on stage, and it doesn't go so well. Um, you know, they weren't just like these auras, you know, that would just terrorize me during the, a Brahms symphony. My body couldn't keep going during that. But the next piece, apparently, was that my left hand would go to if it, if it got to the motor strip, I couldn't play anymore. And people actually thought that, that fateful night, that I played the wrong movement. And I thought, I didn't play anything. Um, but, but I found out later that what happens is my left hand goes to stomach, my right arm keeps moving in, in this like rhythmic epileptic kind of motion. And so they just thought I was playing the fast movement during the slow movement. Um, <laughs> and I went, oh. <laughs> but I knew, but I was the one who knew what actually would have happened because I knew it seized. And I knew nobody was going to pay me a full-time salary to seize in their orchestra. Uh, those are kind of expensive seizures and a full-time salary. And I, I quit playing for a while. I dove into another part of life and learned that I couldn't do it without a violin in my hands. That the life wasn't okay. So when I started playing again, I, you know, I got my system well used, as it were, by playing. And figured out that there were part-time orchestras. They're fully professional. They don't pay as much because they don't play as often. And I realized, you know, I was raised in a capitalist country that the bottom line for this manager would be more okay. They would be less expensive seniors. Uh, so I didn't, you know, I never told anyone when they took auditions. You know, the people who say you have to tell everyone are just wrong. I don't tell people. I walked in, I played the audition, I established myself as a violinist, this conductor wanted in this orchestra. And I sat down and played. And um, <laughs> the first, the first that I had on stage was a rehearsal. 
And it was this repetitive place where you went over and over and over and repetition I didn't do very easily without seizing. And before I, you know, somehow I got that stage with a, with a um, manager going, are you okay? I said, I'm fine, why? <laughs> and she said, just rest. I said, no, I can't. She said, no, just rest. I said, no, give me my violin, I can do this. And she said, Mark, just rest. And I said, no, I can't do that. Because quite frankly, I never knew what would happen if I rested. I was back, and I needed to play. Um, so, she actually, I didn't know how to get there. I got up and started walking around. I could hear this Beethoven symphony still going on. And I kind of walked around to find the stage and couldn't find it at all because my eyes always hooked up after my ears. And um, then she laughed at me. And I knew I had her where I needed her because now she was a little less worried. She was now laughing and I looked at her and I said, hey, look, just find me the stage. I can't find the people. If you find me the stage, I'll play you the violin. <laughs> and she opened a door that I didn't perceive. I couldn't tell. I was, you know, there was a door there. And she could walk me out. Um, but what happened was I found my chair, and I always sat like at the top of the, you know, like fourth chair for his violin. And so I walked all the way up there. I sat down. My violin went up, and I started the piece. You know, I just like picked up where they were and finished this symphony. And it's because my body was so well trained. You got to have something to totally in love with that you learn really well. And that entered me back into the beauty and power of Beethoven. There was a whole orchestra already playing it. I just had to go fill in one of the violin parts, and there I had it. Um, now that's, you know, I, I use this phrase, I am, therefore I will, a lot, and it's because I wasn't all. You know, you come and go. Out of, you know, those people who say you learn how to just be, they go, you're right. <laughs> you know, that's kind of contingent on this brain that goes for every now and then. And I made sure I could always do. And it makes the rest of the world crazy, right? But, but that was the job for me. It's like get conscious and use that. That is the only chance. Once you're conscious, you can, you can pull a lot off. You can decide what to do and you can go do it. Um, so, I, this, I continued to walk back on stage feeling full I could see. Um, because realize, you know, that the, defi the definition of success, I wasn't playing a full-time orchestra, but I just decided, we decided success every time I turned around. I just redefined it. Because there's no reason to leave the definition of success up to the world. No. Nah. So I kept walking back on stage, knowing that I could see. Because if I got there like five, you know, five times a month, the simple partial would break through to a complex partial, and people would see it. Um, and, but people wondered, how do you do this? And that my desire to perform could override my fear of seizure. I finally decided that actually, I would be having the hardest time. Everybody else would freak out a little. But I would be having the hardest time. So they'd really actually be okay. I didn't have to take care of them. I could go out there and I could play. Um, the key here really is desire because it's, that's what provides the passion necessary to maneuver against ridiculous odds. And it provides the drive needed for victory. And I'm going to play a little section of a Bach fugue that is, is that for me, that drive to victory.
So I just taught the world how to cook. I mean, because that first seizure, nobody knew what was happening. Um, and I've never said seizure, and I certainly never said epilepsy. I looked at my stamp partner, because he would be the closest up and the most scared when I would kind of click out. And I taught him to get my boss, and you know, my eyes get a little glassy, and I'd say something weird. Because I used to turn to people and say things like, you know, don't let me die. <laughs> um, and I said, can I start? And if I start playing garbage, I'm not playing the piece. You know, just get my violin and my bow out of my hands, put them on the floor, and I'll be back. Um, because I wasn't falling over in Grandma seat at that point, you know, and I knew I could sit there, seize, and I would come back. So the next seizure in that particular orchestra was during a performance, and not in Fray, a great pianist, was on stage playing the Beethoven Emperor Concerto. This was a performance this time, so, and I knew, I, I knew I was going, but I didn't know it would go all the way and to a complex partial seizure. Because, you know, I keep, I keep eating out of my terror from time to time. But anyway, so when I was realizing that people were playing and Frege was playing and the conductor was conducting, people around me had their instruments up. I realized I'd been gone for a bit and I looked down and saw my violin and bow and just picked it up because I knew I had full consciousness. I knew I was back. When I could hear my own brain saying, you can do it, come on, you can do it, I know you can do it. And with the unimpaired, what was so cool is with unimpaired consciousness comes an incredible amount of power. The power to decide. And this one, you know, so I picked up the violin and I finished the piece. He showed me where we were. I kind of, hmm. Um, it was into the last movement, but ba yeah, ba yeah, but it did that, you know, did it like that. It's hard enough to do conscious. But, um, but I, I didn't think I'd the piano for the first. Um, so I finished a piece, and this went on for years. And until something bigger happened, um, actually d during this time when playing all these orchestras, I met a cellist in my quartet who saw a lot of seniors. I was in the middle of a drug change, and, and sometimes in quartets, you're doing real slow um, work together. And so I seized a lot. But this cellist did the only thing, it was the first person in my life who would look at me after a seizure and smile. He'd smile, and then he'd tell me what happened. He had a seizure. And then he'd re reassure me, you're gonna be okay. Do you know how valuable that is? You know, to have a face that's okay <laughs> to come back to? There is nothing more important. I teach this all the time to kids. You know, if, if someone's having a big seizure, go get a drawing. You know, they don't need to try to handle rolling someone around. You know, I was talking to third graders once. I said, but the most important thing you're gonna do is smile when she knows you're there again. Smile at her and be a friend. That's all she needs. Um, now, I married that cellist <laughs> because he was the only person in my life. <laughs> he was the only person in the world who had ever been able to do that. Now, so we went along playing in these orchestras for a long time. Now, reality changed huge in 1990. I knew that I had, mm, something had happened. I, I knew. I knew when I clicked out in the orchestra. I kind of assumed I'd click back in, but I came to on the floor on my back um, with someone, I, I could hear this voice saying, heart rate, okay, breathing returning to normal. I thought, oh man, that does not sound right. And I had a grandma seizure and, when I, and I, was, I said, just let me back on stage and they said, no. I said, no, nobody's ever done that. And then my husband came and said, no. I said, no. I, I gotta go back on stage. What I didn't know is only half my body was working that when someone walked into the audience, they, I had to, you know, one of my legs wasn't working, somehow they got me there. I had no idea <laughs> how my body wasn't working because I was very used to just going back out there. So I was just, you know, I just cried through the second half. Um, but then there were three more that month and they were all, well, three of them were on stage, one of them was in a car driving to a concert. So um, it had changed. And by June, I was in, I was sitting in front of um, 
Hans Luders at the Cleveland Clinic. Now this guy was my 11th neurologist in life. In all fairness, I didn't fire 10, I moved a lot. I only had to say goodbye to a few of those. You know. um, but he, this guy was the first one to understand music as my driving force. He was the first one to look into my eyes and see the problem. Now, I've been to many, many doctors, and I'd say, I can't see three times a day. The world is jiggling. I was having like high levels of Tegretol. So the world is jiggling, and I couldn't walk across the street by myself while that was happening, because you have no depth perception. Um, I was not okay with me, but everybody said to me, we put people on more Tegretol than this, and I thought, yeah. Um, which, of course, wasn't important to me, but it was looters. My, my blood never showed toxic levels of anything. Um, but Luders looked at my face, and his heart broke. He said, Martha, how do you see the music? I thought, I'm in love. This guy cares about what I care about. He can do what he needs to do. And he put me in the epilepsy monitoring unit. I don't know how many people out there have been through this fun piece. Um, but that's when they're getting seizures 24 hours. They're getting brain waves 24 hours a day. And they do that by... <laughs> But they do that by, um, like all my EEGs have been normal all my life. And so they put two through my jaws also. And uh, there's a cool little hole that just like, you can go straight through with a needle uh, with a microelectrode and pull out the needle and leave a little electrode on the other side of the temporal lobe. Which means they could measure then what was happening, where it was happening. Um, and this is the first person who ever got like the, you know, the real juice on their situation and he came to me after a, after word um, and said that there was spiking bad spiking almost 24 hours a day and um, and you know I'm on uncharted waters I said let's chart the waters and the next test was a water test where they turn off half the brain and talk to just the left they played music to this side and um, I couldn't hear melody without my left brain. <clears throat> with, with only my right brain working, I didn't hear music. Um, so we went through with the first surgery. And after the first surgery, right out of intensive care, the surgeon wanted to hear me play. And I know there's a cool little button here somewhere. Face. I mean, he had only breathed in and not out. And so I stood up, I just like dropped his jaw curtis, and I stood up and played Brothers of Dennis Valley Concerto just for fun. And um, that's at one point he said, Go give me, go give me photography. And um, I, so when the guy came in, I just looked at him and you know, I looked at him before and I said, I'm not doing this on film after a surgery like that. I'm not strong enough. And he said, they just took still shots. He said, be sure to get the incision and divide it. <laughs> so, um, the problem was that I started seizing again. Uh, and at that point, I mean, they were really worried about music memory. What they were talking about was music memory. So that I thought it was the ability to play from memory. It's not. He said, we were just wondering if you would know how to, if you would know what to do with a bow. And he was worried that I was going to open my case and not know what this was, um, and that I was related to it. So I was really glad I got through that one. Um, <laughs> I started seizing again, I had a second surgery, and um, the surgeon didn't want to do another one. And I went to the eyes in the mirror and said, you can take this on any can, and I talked him into it. Um, so the next surgery placed those microelectrodes right on the brain, and this one is cool, because behind the eye, like the fourth one in was the only one starting seizures. They come in and they just juice these electrodes. They, they, you've got wires hanging out of your head and they just put through electricity to see what happens. And 
their laws. It was only the small piece of amygdala. By this time, they have like half the temple rolled out, the whole hippocampus, and two thirds of the amygdala, and I'm still seizing. And he was just, I've never seen anyone have seizure with this small piece of amygdala. So I said, well, hello. Um, and before this, the last surgery, he was going to take out some more brain, as much as he did, and came in with a scan and said, said, Martha, here's the piece, here's your optic nerve. I could so easily blind him. Mom. I said, don't do that. Yeah, it's going to be okay. Um, and then he said, hey, what you can't see is the, the large bundle of blood vessels right next to this that feed your whole right brain. I could down your whole left side. He said, touch wood, it's never happened to me. And I said, it's going to be okay. I'm here because you're really good. And then he let me know there's no visible boundary. I will only slice till I will slice no more. You don't want to get my front alone. Um, but we won. We won. I came too from that one. And they just wanted to know, squeeze my fingers. They wanted to I could play. They wanted to know if I had my left hand. Um, and people, if people ask, you know, I can't believe you had to coach your own surgeon. And I just say, you know, it was a, it was a man, it was a person. He was the one with the knife. <laughs> and you know, if you really want a life you want to live, you have to stay that involved. You know? <laughs>